Hello, hello, hello. I am very, very honoured indeed to be joined by the superb Hamza Said and Brian Reed of the block. It is a blockbuster. It's a blockbuster podcast, <laughs> New York Times serial, uh, the Trojan Horse Affair, shot to the top of the charts of the podcast charts. Um, you've both met the British media then. <laughs> From a distance, yeah. Speaking <laughs> truth to power, speaking truth yeah. to power as ever, as is their want, standing mm. up for the rights of embattled minorities. Um, look, I just want to start, Just some people might not have heard the podcast, and you should absolutely go and listen to the podcast. You're going to get spoilers here, but just carry on listening anyway and listen to the podcast afterwards. Um, it is superb. It's a brilliant piece of journalism. It's thorough. It's detailed. It takes you through the craft. It takes you through a big learning process. It takes you behind the scenes in, in, in lots of different ways. It's, it's a really brilliant uh, piece of work. Um, and just so people, for people aren't aware, I sum up the scandal. So a letter, this letter appears, which seems to be, if you look at it, kind of like a crude caricature of uh, something an Islamist extremist, uh, you know, someone who's pretending to be one. Just say what happened in, in a succinct way. What are we talking about? Over to you, Brian. You're good at Go this. on, Brian. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Brian, go. No. Um, Yes, an, uh, a strange partial letter, four pages of a letter, no front page, no back page, um, appeared on uh, the leader of the Birmingham City Council's desk in uh, November 2013. Um, when you read it, you know, it was poorly copied, kind of weird shadows at the edges, said to destroy it after reading, like that kind of vibe. And uh, um, when you read it, it appeared to be plans, basically, um, that were being sent from um, a Muslim con extremist conspirator in Birmingham who'd been involved in a plot called Operation Trojan Horse to infiltrate the city schools to another conspirator, co-conspirator in Bradford to kind of franchise this, this plan, Operation Trojan out, uh, Horse, out there. Um, and, um, you know, for a while this wasn't public. This was kind of being dealt with internally at the Birmingham City Council. Um, until spring of 2014, when the letter leaked to the press, made its way to the Department for Education, which was headed at the time um, by then Secretary of State for Education, Michael Gove. And it became a huge national scandal, which I'm sure, you know, a lot of your, a lot of people who are watching this probably remember at least parts of um, the Trojan Horse Affair, whereby, um, you know, Ofsted was sent in for SNAP inspections of a bunch of Muslim majority schools in Birmingham. Um, uh, Michael Gove drafted in the former uh, chief of counter-terror command at Scotland Yard, a man named Peter Clark, to go do a special investigation in Birmingham. There was a local investigation, just many investigations, speeches in Parliament, which all resulted in um, educators being banned for life from education, um, kind of sweeping changes in Birmingham schools, uh, changes to national education policy. And then the affair was used to um, kind of beef up and make changes to prevent uh, the Prevent Counter Extremism Program, um, which are still um, in effect today, um, you know, kind of obligating uh, certain public sector workers to, you know, report what they mean to be, you know, extremist behaviors um, among their students, for instance, in a classroom or doctors among patients, things like that. Um, that's the Trojan Horse Affair. What what strike it really reminded me of um, as a student of history was an effect, the Zinoviev letter. Affair. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know about the Zinoviev letter, it was a forged letter in 1924, uh, the head of the Communist International, as it was then, uh, where there was a, a letter forged suggesting that communist revolution was going to take part in Britain, yeah. take place in Britain. On the eve of an election, I believe. Right? On the eve of an election, where yeah. Labour was a minority government, and it actually helped create a red scare, which led to Labour right uh, partly losing that election so one of the things and to put it to hamza what struck me about this podcast before we just go into the details of it is it's like a flare this i mean you've, you've chosen what it's, it's a particular incident that lights up a lot of other broader issues to do with islamophobia in british society um we live in a country where uh for example, British Muslims are likely to live in the poorest communities disproportionately. There's very few um, British Muslims, for example, in the British media, which I do think is very much part of the story here. The number of Muslim journalists is exceptionally low uh, in, in newspaper outlets, in, in national media outlets. Um, and the way the media talk about uh, Muslims is studies have shown the majority of stories about Muslims are negative. Uh, 
the Mail on Sunday is the worst, but other newspapers are very bad as well, where you get the front page of the Sun or the Times, the paper record, splashing inaccurate stories about Muslims, then forcing to do corrections when the damage is already done. Mm. So, I mean, th this kind of is an example, isn't it? It lights up a flare, really, about Muslims in Britain in this part of the 21st century and the level of prejudice and bigotry that's that's ingrained and systemic. Yeah, I think I think the Trojan horse has um, the most kind of distilled versions of all of those. You know, you have a patently bogus document that turned up, which was just riddled with factual errors that if anybody at any point cared to Google for five minutes, they would recognize that this whole thing is a joke. OK, so that first step didn't happen um, because maybe there's something in that document that spoke to people's ideas about us. OK, then you look at the level at which local government, the um, national government and reporters what they made of this case and it kind of gives you a snapshot of what we're up against as far as muslims in britain are concerned um and you know in particular reporters i would say because i don't think the trojan horse affair became becomes what it did if it wasn't for the way um british journalists decided to wield this letter um and write what they would term exciting sexy headlines but in reality were just you know ridiculous dribble um and yeah, if you want, if you want to get a real clarifying kind of uh, um, case study of what Islamophobia is, um, I think you do a decent job listening to Trojan Horse Affair. Now, what I'm going to do is go through some of the findings of the report, which I do think have been eclipsed by the media coverage in Britain, which I alluded to at the beginning. For those who missed that, I was being a little sarcastic. Um, and just before we go through some of those details, look, th this letter. This ludicrous letter. I have to say, it's just it's just a ludicrous letter for anyone who who reads what the letter said. Do you think there's a link actually between the way we'll talk about this more, but between the way the media failed to try and interrogate the letter to actually ask who did the letter, which is what your podcast seeks to do, who is behind the letter? You'd think that'd be the first thing you'd do, um, and the media's response in Britain to the podcast itself, because I think they're kind of interlinked. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a, the response to the podcast has been a defense of that decision to ignore the letter. And, you know, the, the you know, the kind of standard line this, that's been kind of repeated about this, both at the time and now, is, yeah, 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 the letter was probably a hoax or was a hoax, but... Um, you know, it's still a good thing that it happened because it prompted investigations, which found some problems in schools. That's basically the justification. And I just have to say, like, as an outsider to this, I've worked, you know, I've, I've now worked on this story for three plus years. Um, but as an outsider to this, I, I can't, I can often get myself as a reporter inside of other people's arguments uh, and like imagine it at least. I can't with this. I don't understand. I'm not saying problems in schools are important. And our podcast doesn't seek to minimize those. But this is a massive forgery that was perpetrated on the British public on the scale of the Zenobia letter, I would argue, or the protocols of the elders of Zion, like in that realm of impact and import to say that investigating how that forgery came about, trying to actually like drum up facts to you know offer a definitive debunking of it is not what journalists should be doing, that that's a waste of time or the wrong way to be thinking about this. I do not understand it. I welcome anyone to try and like convince me otherwise, but you you, you can't talk about this. I, I don't understand how anybody was ever talking about what actually happened here um, without understanding the nature of and the provenance of this letter and what it was actually about, this forgery that started it all. And I mean, this was Hamza's pitch to me the first night we met, it was the first two minutes that we ever spoke he had the same question and it made complete sense to me and i still don't understand how it doesn't make sense to other people i don't know <laughs> it, it's confusing to me yeah we just quickly on that i mean just yeah. for those who don't yeah. know if you haven't seen the articles yeah. it's basically been a very defensive and angry response i would say from uh from the british media Hamza, i mean what what what's your thoughts in terms of the link between the failure to kind of basic intellectual curiosity about the letter itself and then the response to your podcast which has been very very defensive i know i feel like it's i feel like it's the um the same phenomenon like in 2014 there was a very concerted effort to move the conversation on beyond this instigating document 
and kind of um you know kind of get it all muddled in this just like allegations and crosstalk and you know uh non-specific ideas about what's happening in these schools and that happened in 2014 and became such a confusing nebulous scandal that it really it really you know people were unclear about what happened um in birmingham so here comes a podcast that tries to tell the story from the beginning once upon a time there was this fake letter and it landed on this dude's desk and let's figure this out um and i feel like the effort by the journalists since uh, the podcast has come out is the same phenomenon how do we very quickly shift this conversation on from the letter from what happened and take it back to um you know claims and allegations and unverified reports about what was happening um so it's just the same thing and you know to a large extent you'd say it's 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 kind of working because i haven't seen any authority have to respond to this i haven't seen anyone take our report on and, and and take it further um so you know kudos to them they had a tactic back then and they repeated it you know? <laughs> and just um, to say like there's something that could be done like like you brought up the zenobia letter oh and like um it's my understanding that there was event it was late but there was eventually an official inquiry into who created that document who created decades that, later that yeah. decades later here where there's an opportunity i think that's a decent precedent in terms of the fact of it maybe not the timing but like if that it, you know if, if the country like admitted that eventually it was worth trying to uh fill out the record on that forgery which was so impactful mm -hmm. even if it was decades late i think there's a, a very good argument that the same should happen with the Trojan horse letter, except now there's an opportunity to actually get to the bottom of it and actually, you know, try to force some accountability because it is so contemporary. It's, you know, just 10 years old or less. Absolutely. And I think there's a really good argument to that, you know, at the very minimum, the police, but like, you know, some parliamentary committee or, or, or commission should be launched into the source of the letter, which never happened. By the way, Owen, just to say, it's not that complicated to, uh, to launch that inquiry into where this letter came from. Like, it's not quite that wide net that everyone kind of assumes it is. Like, the letter came from a very specific situation, a very specific school. And if anybody, anyone in authority was motivated to kind of be like, actually, yeah, we should figure this out, it's not going to take years. Um, and that's that's the other disappointing thing, is it continues to be talked about this kind of like, how are we going to figure this out? Where do we begin? You know, there's a whole nationwide search for this author. Well, not really. Yeah. Actually, you just have to look at one situation. Yeah. And in fact, we found evidence in our reporting that you know, the people looking at this, the people investigating this knew, you know, like where to look. They knew to look at this one primary school, Adderley Primary School, as the source of the letter and all actively looked away. It should be clear. I mean, this letter which suggested there was this co coordinated Islamist extremist to take over Birmingham schools. Obviously, that has been proven. That's just simply not true at all. Several government investigations, one carried out by former Met counter-terror chief Peter Clark. That itself is alarm bells and raised alarm bells at the time, quite rightly. The fact a counter-terror chief, he didn't try to ascertain the veracity of the letter. Misconduct tribunal against the teachers collapsed. No charges against extremism uh, against the teachers. So this is genuinely it's scandalous because the impact on community relations, I think 90% of Birmingham Muslims said it had a negative impact. And obviously in a country with huge Islamophobia issues, it has a big, big impact in terms of surging hate crimes and so on. Just in terms of, let's just talk about this letter then. What's the theory? This is, I think, extraordinary. That it originated from a dispute involving a teacher and some teaching assistants at a local primary school. What the hell? Explain this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard one to explain. <laughs> the, quick, the quickest way to explain this. Um, I'm going to do like a Cliff Notes version here, okay? There's a primary school uh, in East Birmingham, majority Muslim primary school in December, 2012. Um, there's basically a head teacher there um, named Rizvan Adar. She's fighting with four low level staff for teaching assistance. Um, there are grievances flying against each other. They don't, they don't get along. And um, one day in December, she basically, or you know, one week in December, she basically informs the four of them in two different instances um, that she's received their resignation letters and thanks for their service to the school and she accepts their resignations. And the four teaching assistants say in response, what are you talking about? We didn't resign. We didn't submit any resignation letters. And Rizvan Adar, the head teacher says, yes, you did. Thanks so much for your service. And this kind of spirals into this very strange and bizarre employment dispute where you have four employees claiming that they never resigned or sent resignation letters and this head teacher producing resignation letters with their signatures on them the signatures are then later shown to not be genuine. 
on the resignation letters. And this goes to an employment tribunal. There's a bunch of complaints. The police begin to look into it. And basically the head teacher's in a lot of hot water. Um, and right at that moment when the, when the trial's moving ahead, uh, the tribunal's moving ahead, and also some investigations are moving ahead, the Trojan horse, this is all before the Trojan horse letter, right at that moment, stop me if this is not clear, but right, right at that moment, the Trojan horse letter appears in November 2013. And it's describing this citywide plot called Operation Trojan Horse to push out head teachers at various uh, schools across the city, you know, run by these extremist conspirators. And it gives a bunch of exa a few examples of schools where the head teacher is being targeted. And the main example, like the one that is dealt with at most detail and length in the letter, is this weird, bizarre resignation dispute at Adderley Primary School. And the way the Trojan horse letter makes it sound is that these four teaching assistants were part of this Islamist conspiracy. They're secret agents inside of Adderley Primary School, and that they've concocted this resignation situation to frame the head teacher, Rizvan Adar, and get her sacked or force her to resign so that someone could be placed in to, uh, to Islamize the school more, basically. And that's what the letter claims. And so, and, and Rizvan Adar then goes on to use this letter, which we know is bogus, which authorities admit is bogus, in legal proceedings and elsewhere to clear her name, to argue that she was the victim of a plot by these teaching assistants. And she's largely successful. Now, this letter, in terms of when it came into public view, wasn't actually out of the blue at all in lots of ways, because you actually found an internal report from the city council, which identified a possible fake letter. And that was actually weeks before the Trojan horse letter actually appeared. Is that right, Hamza? So this is one of the things you discover, which, again, British journalists haven't really haven't zoned in on. <laughs> Yeah, in the, in the months leading up to when this uh, Trojan horse had turned up at the council, uh, the Birmingham City Council itself had got involved in that situation involving this allegation of um, fraud, essentially, at this primary school, Adderley. And these other four suspicious letters that the t teaching assistants were saying, we did not author and we haven't signed this. Um, the Birmingham City Council conducted an investigation. Their audit team did a months-long investigation into that case, and they concluded that the teaching assistants were not uh, responsible for those resignation letters that they had been forged and without any evidence to kind of like say definitively their suspicion was that the head teacher of that primary school Rizvan Adar um, had been part of manufacturing these these fake letters and they referred they, they referred her to the police they said the police should look into this case now this report had been concluded signed off on weeks before the Trojan horse had turned up when the Trojan horse had turned up not only does it reframe that resignation situation at Adelie as, um, you know, some kind of uh, Islamist conspiracy plot, but also it speaks about councils and internal investigations and possible audit reports that might suggest otherwise as part of the plot. Like it names the officer at the Bowen City Council who'd signed off on that audit report as a conspirator, as a mole within the council who's working with these Islamists. Like it's very obvious you know what i mean that's what i'm saying like it's not very it's not a clever letter it's not it doesn't it has this kind of allure of being mythical and like um undiscoverable who authored it but in reality it's it's all there now what's interesting about this is the report debunks what the trojan horse letter goes on in a very crude and absurd way as i think we've already established uh and with evidence where it actually likely came from but they actually then withdrew the report. So just explain this. And th Brian, this must be bizarre for you because as an American, because an injunction, you get they threaten to they threaten to put an injunction against you. There's a thing throughout the podcast and lots of legal threats. And um, mm. and the First Amendment, whatever people think of it, uh, pros and cons in the US would would preclude that kind of action. So just explain this, this report. <laughs> and I'm mean, interested what you think, Brian, just about... You're going to ask me to explain injunctions to you guys? Okay. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, I don't need <laughs> an explanation of an injunction. No, I'm um, happy to. I have a lot of feelings about it. I think yeah, I want to hear your thoughts. As I an American journalist, it must be... I will I say this in the show, but I'm, I'm, I I, mean, Hansa will verify, like, I, like, over the course of this process, like, I've been sincerely surprised at how tangibly I'm, I've missed reporting with the first amendment like I, I just and how much i took it for granted and and it's not just the injunction like it, it every it's like like the um the lack of 
access to information and protection for reporters, it suffuses everything. And the lack of it was like present in almost everything we did um, in the UK. And that I'll talk about the injunction in a second, but like, you know, even just in my opinion, I don't think you guys necessarily have an open court system <laughs> like in Britain, like the access to court documents is wild to me. The way that anonymity is granted to witnesses, the way that decisions are redacted, the way that records are destroyed and, and destruction, you know, schemes, like it's not always easy to get records here from courts, for instance, but you're going to get them in almost every case besides some like crazy kind of FISA national security stuff for the most part, or, you know, certain, um, you know, sex crimes or, you know, things involving children. But um, I was just very surprised that the access to information is, is much more encumbered in my experience um, working in the UK. And one thing that was very different was the experience uh, with this injunction threat. Um, so yeah, so this report that you mentioned, we got a, got a copy of it. Um, this is this internal report from the Birmingham City Council um, investigating this resignation dispute, uh, which came to the opposite conclusion as the Trojan horse letter based on evidence and facts rather than like a dodgy, <laughs> you know, unsigned letter. Um, but after the Trojan horse affair blew up and became this national scandal, the council retra officially retracted this report and its findings and went to great lengths to make sure it did not see the light of the day, made sure it was not entered into public court proceedings, the reporters couldn't see it, made, really worked hard to keep it out of public view. And when we got a copy of it um, and they learned it, they sent us a, a threatening letter basically saying we needed to give it back <laughs> and uh, that we weren't to talk about it or report about it anymore and that they would go uh, in front of a judge um, to get the judge to gag us from speaking about it. And so that's the, that's the injunction part. Now that is almost unheard of as an actual possibility in the US. Like that's what's called a prior restraint on speech, which the First Amendment in almost every instance um, precludes. You cannot do that in the US. I think the only kind of like acceptable um, instance where you'd be able to put a prior restraint on someone's speech is like troop movements in, in time of war or something like that, that, that the Supreme Court has found. So we just don't have that here. That's not a consideration. Like people threaten and say like, I'll come after you if you publish this, you're wrong. But there's not a real situation where you can imagine before publishing being pulled in front of a judge and the judge being able to tell you you can't report something. That's just not a consideration we really have to consider here. But it was very real in the UK. It's a very real consideration. Um, and I find it troubling. Like, I think it's problematic. I think in this case, for instance, it was abused by the council, like at least in our experience. And I can imagine it being abused, you know, every which way. Um, to chill and silence reporting because it takes time and money to deal with it before you even put out your story. It takes time, money, work, lawyers. It was a lot of work to navigate that injunction and to still be able to report um, or that injunction threat and still be able to report on this auto report. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it, You guys really do face some obstacles in my opinion that um, I'm sympathetic about. Um, but I don't know how like Everybody seems to accept it, in my view. Like, like the people I've dealt with um, in the UK seem to be like, yeah, that's part of life here, which which I understand. But it it, um, it was hard for me to accept, and still is. <laughs> so the former leader of the council, yeah. Sir Albert Bohr, I mean, he was he says he's shocked by what you discovered, and suggests it could have changed the entire direction of the affair. And this again is something which has been missed in lots of reporting because. This is, he ran the council. Uh, you know, he's he, he knows how the council works. He's familiar with the local communities that that council represents. I mean, that's that. I mean, that is itself pretty pretty revealing, isn't it? You'd hope so. You'd, You'd hope, hope so. so. Wouldn't you? <laughs> Here is the one-time leader of Birmingham City Council, the person who was in charge when the Trojan Horse affair, um, you know, happened. Mm -hmm confronting our evidence and saying that there's possibly been a huge error here, one of the biggest of his career. He was kind of speaking in those terms. Um, and, you know, the city's been misled, the country's been misled, like, oh, my God, what are we going to do about this? Um, and then about, I don't know, a week later or something, we get the injunction threat from the Birmingham City Council to try to kill the story. And uh, when the story does come out, um, silence. 
silence from like you know reporters on 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 that um declaration I'm very interested in the role of Michael Gove. Michael Gove, last time I saw Michael Gove, I was chasing after him. I mean, when I say chasing after him, I was literally chasing after him. Um, at Conservative <laughs> Party Conference in Manchester, and he did this thing which he tries to charm you. He's put some little charm, Michael Gove. I was trying to ask him about universal credit cuts driving children into poverty. And he was like, you're from near here, aren't you? You're from Stockport. So I suppose this is a home away from home. It was like, stop. Just stop trying mm. to distract me with trivia about my that. background. That's, yeah, that's I, remember that. I remember that clip, yeah. Um, now, the reason I'm interested is, particularly with Michael Gove, is back in 2019, I interviewed Baroness Saida Varsi, who is the most senior Muslim Tory female politician. Um, and she told me that she feared, this was be before Boris Johnson became prime minister, and Michael Gove was one of the runners and riders, that she was scared of him becoming prime minister. Um, that... Uh, his opinions expressed, for example, in Celsius 777, sorry, Celsius 77, mm -hmm. a book he wrote in 2006, uh, which spoke about a sizable minority of Britain's one, um, well, 1 1.8 million Muslims at the time holding rejectionist Islamist views, uh, spoke about the influence of organised work by those sympathetic to an Islamist agenda in the UK, uh, used dodgy polling evidence, which others contradicted at the time, and said that she'd helped radicalise David Cameron on the issue, but other Tory colleagues had spoken out um, about their concerns about his attitudes. So I think that's important context with Michael Gove, given what he wrote in that book years before the Trojan Horse uh, affair, because actually what he was suggesting there in that book in 2006 was this sense of an organised plot mm -hmm. within British society. There's actually a chapter called The Trojan Horse in the book. Yeah. Well, there you go. So <laughs> that, as soon as he gets his letter, it's like, my worldview here, here's, here's prima facie evidence. So tell us about the role of a, the cabinet minister. He's one of the most senior conservatives at the moment. Michael Gove and all of this. Who wants to go on that? Who wants to go on Govey? The Gove Hamza. Mike? Hamza. Go on, Hamza. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm yeah. going to put this very, very simply, just so like people can just take this message home. Michael Gove was told before the Trojan horse letter ever went public, he was told that this letter is bogus. The counter-terror cops in West Midlands have looked at this, the Birmingham City Council have looked at this, and this letter is bogus. It has serious credibility issues. He was told this. About, I think, I want to say like a week or, or two weeks later, the first reports start coming out publicly about the Trojan horse letter. And just listen to the way Michael Gove spoke about the letter since. He was in Parliament referencing it, right? That's all you need to know about Michael Gove is this man was very clear. Every time he referenced the Trojan horse, that he was very clear what he was told, that this was a bogus document. Um, what he decided to make of it, why he decided to draft in a counter-terror cop um, to go investigate HR matters, personnel matters in schools in East Birmingham, that's, that's, you know, those are the questions I hope someone puts to him at some point. But what we've understood of his role is that he was clearly told. And actually, funnily enough, he said in the, in the minutes of the meeting that we have in February between um, Councillor Sarabha Bohr, the leader of the council, and Michael Gove, he says that somebody should figure out where this letter came from. Like, he points that out as a thing worthwhile doing, but then doesn't bother to do that himself, doesn't bother to ask his investigator to do that, or possibly even thinks it's worthwhile now. Um, so, yeah, that's Michael Gove, yeah. yeah. Now... In terms of, uh, there was another anonymous letter, should be said, that drew the attention of Gove, um, and he conducted, ex so you, you actually interviewed that letter writer. Just tell, tell us quickly about that, that letter. So yeah, what we found in our reporting, um, you know, which again was trying to kind of trace this, this affair and scandal from the actual beginning, which is the provenance of this first Trojan horse letter, his first anonymous letter coming to the council, what the authorities did with it kind of at every step, like who knew what, when, and what they did with it. And um, so, you know, Birmingham city council received the Trojan horse letter in uh, late 2013. Not much is happening until early 2014, like January, February. That's when Michael Gove um, summons the leader of the council at the time, Sir Albert Bohr down to London to discuss, uh, you know, this, this threat. And within weeks, it becomes a national scandal. And um, what ended up happening, what we've seen in our reporting, is that basically in early 2014, another um, anonymous letter writer 
um, was sending complaints to various authorities that eventually made their way to uh, the Department for Education. And uh, this was a, um, a former employee at the school, kind of at the center of the uh, Trojan horse allegations, uh, Parkview School, um, which we talk about a lot in the podcast, which was, you know, a school in East Birmingham that had, um, you know, been dismal, had something like 4% pass rates for years and years, serving a majority Muslim student population. And people from the local community had joined the governing body, become teachers there and taken it to um, an outstanding school with, you know, upwards of 80% pass rates in a matter of 15 years uh, or something like that you know, praised by educationalists, you know, all over the country, people go around Europe coming to view the school and see what, you know, what was going on there. They were then um, named in the Trojan Horse Center and became the focus of the, of where this threat might be, uh, like the, kind of the ground zero of this threat. And um, this was a former employee there who um, basically had various complaints um, related to what she saw as an inappropriate Islamic influence. Um, on Parkview School. Um, and that probably requires like some explanation. There was an Islamic ethos at a number of these schools in the Trojan Horse Affair. That's admitted by everybody. The people accused of wrongdoing, the people doing the accusing. Um, kind of the disagreement is about whether it was unlawful or inappropriate in some way, because religious uh, elements are a part of, are, you know, statutorily a part of every school in Britain, whether or not it's a faith school or not. Well, on, on that, I think it's a really important point. Britain is the only sovereign state in the world to impose Christian worship in state schools as standard, something I know all too well. I still know, I'm, I'm not a believer, but I, I know I know Christian hymns off by heart because I sang, I did, engaged in religious worship every day, which I was legally directed to do because that was compulsory. I mean, it's also I find it's not, not a faith school, right? Not a faith school. No, 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 no. I never went to. I, I went to. I went to comprehensive state schools. Mm -hmm. My primary school. Every single day, we had assembly where we sang religious hymns and 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 did prayers, and often had sermons conducted by our teachers. That was every single day until the age of eleven years old. And so your school I mean, was operating within the law then, because I think a lot exactly, of schools don't actually do it, or they kind of do it in a nominal way, you know. Um, of course, yeah. of course. I mean, it's it's, but this interest about religiosity because you should, be, you know, Britain is not a secular state officially; it's a Christian state. The states and the church are fused together. Yeah. Uh, we're the only, again, country in, on earth other than in Iran <laughs> to have religious uh, to have clerics sitting in our legislature as an automatic. Uh, as, as something which is automatic. The reason I'm raising this is that religiosity, which is woven into our fabric and our educational fabric is seen as normal and faith schools, which I don't support, but they are, they're, they're seen as something which are kind of encouraged. And, uh, but what this is all about is, is something is about Muslim religiosity. And that's something which is focused on and stigmatized in a very specific way. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah, exactly. And that's what happened here. Yeah. Sorry, Hansa. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, yeah. beyond a certain point, because up to 2012, so this is like uh, a year and a half before the Trojan Horse that it came out, up to 2012, Ofsted were specifically praising those elements at Parkview School, the school that became mm -hmm. the center, the epicenter uh, of, the, of uh, the Trojan Horse. Like, Ofsted went in, they um, graded that school as outstanding. Um, the head of Ofsted was there praising it profusely um, at some point. He made a speech, his name was uh, Michael Wilshaw, that uh, all schools in Britain should be like this. You know, uh, the prime minister got involved with celebrating how amazing that school was. Like up to 2012, um, Muslimness or not, that school was being celebrated because it was, you know, performing amazing academically. But also, you know, there's comments in the Ofsted report about all these um, like cultural and religious elements that they had incorporated into the school that was working so successfully. And so... It was the people all running celebrated. the school, they argue that that is what was contributing to the success was kind of an embrace and recognition and allowance for the culture and, and religion of, of the students from this area, basically, and that that was integral to the success. It was not some kind of side thing. And I suppose that's yeah. the issue is partly when people might think to themselves, well, I'm not comfortable with that level of religiosity or whatever being encouraged in schools is the, the point is it, it, it's the fact that it's 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 when it's associated with Islam that it's particularly stigmatized when actually that's rampant 
generally with a Christian ethos throughout the education system in Britain. And that's what's interesting, isn't it? That whatever people think about that particular debate, it's it's the way it's been specifically stigmatized in a way which in this case was trying to make it like it was an organized conspiratorial extremist plot, which clearly it just wasn't. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. Like, I think like there is a worthwhile debate having about religion in schools and whether the two should ever meet. Like, I think that's a fair debate to have, but that is the law of Britain at the moment. That is the law of the country. So, you know, for as long as it's the law, then we have to kind of apply that equally. And when it came to these schools in East Birmingham, that just wasn't the case. What the hell was going on with... Oh, actually, no, before I bring this up, Peter Clark. Let's bring up Peter Clark. I've already mentioned him, former Met County Terror mm-hmm. Chief. Let's just talk about him quickly. Um, actually, he didn't actually... I mean, to be fair, he didn't evidence some of the uh, extreme claims made, but he did make some other claims, which internal records suggest were not proven. So just explain the Peter Clark inquiry and what you found. Brian, do you want to go for that, Brian? Or Hamza? Hamza. Hamza, I'll then Brian. I can go for it. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a hard one to explain. It took us a long time to be able to give some coherence to the Clark report because it is just a, a word jumble. Um, like, Clark's methodology in itself was interesting, as he points out in his own report, that um, he didn't see the need to go to the schools himself. Um, he didn't see the need to speak to students himself. He didn't see the need to even speak to parents or the students himself. Um, so he never visited any of these Trojan Horse schools. Uh, members of his team did, but he personally didn't. Um, he did put out, essentially, he turned up in Birmingham and he put out a roll call to say that I'm Peter Clark and I'm investigating the Trojan horse. And everybody can come speak to me anonymously if they wish. And uh, let's figure out what's happening in these schools. Now, there was a bunch of people who work in these schools who had grievances. You know what I mean? These schools were going through a lot of change. Um, uh, from like, say, late 90s onwards, there were Muslim educators who came who did get involved in their local schools because they were upset at how um, the, the performance of these schools. So there was a lot of, you know, internal, let's just say, politics happening at these schools uh, with, with staffers. Now, Peter Clark provided an opportunity for people to come and speak to these grievances, but the Trojan horse allowed these grievances to be um, all kind of like, you know, placed together as if it's some kind of conspiracy or some kind of plot. So whether, for example, you had an argument with someone, that could be signs of the Trojan horse, whether you were removed because you're a terrible head teacher well that could be the signs of a trojan horse like everything then became signs of trojan horse so he does this inquiry and also you're speaking to the former chief of counter-terror command as well you know yes, or that his, has his own infliction yeah. but then the issue yeah. with, with with the clark report as, as we point out is that he doesn't provide any sourcing or evidence or how he verified any of these allegations or claims like he doesn't from what we could tell make much effort to figure out which of these are just personal grievances being kind of like um, overlaid with this idea of some kind of extremist plot and which ones of these are like, like serious actual issues that need to be looked into and then even contextualize those to be like, does this require changing of our national policies uh, about education and terrorism? So Clark Club has this report together and for the most part, it comes out in 2014 and it's just like received and acted upon and politicians and journalists alike, just like take it as gospel. When the, educators that Clark recommends should be removed from these schools and, and, and possibly banned for life from ever working in education, they eventually end up in misconduct hearings to basically argue for their innocence. Their legal team then gets to, for the first time, uh, it seems, cross-examine some of the evidence in the Clark report and the people who made those claims come along to testify to what they said. And it's that transcript that's quite revealing, uh, the transcript of those hearings. We got one in particular for the um, leadership team at Parkview in which you just see like claim after claim um, get discussed and quite honestly like exposed as just nonsense, you know, mm. more than like, like some of the more serious ones. Like for example, Parkview School, there's a bullet point list of allegations against them in the Clark report. It's still on the DFE website. Like you would think at the very least they would have removed this bit from uh, the report once the story came out. But at the top of the list is uh, a claim Peter Clark puts in there that um, Parkview School, um, there were, um, they had an Al Qaeda like terrorist DVD, which they were uh, burning and like kind of re- reproducing. I don't know for what purpose, but essentially the DVD of Al Qaeda, of Bin Laden stuff, being like you know copied at the school. Well, it turns out like the actual truth of that was that this was local um, prevent officers who realized the school had this DVD burner, who asked if they could use it because they were like uh, as part of their prevent course. And the actual thing that they were burning was a BBC Panorama program about Afghanistan. Now, 
that's how it's described in the Clark Report is Parkview School is burning DVD videos of Al-Qaeda, when in reality, it's a local prevent officer who's copying a BBC Panorama program. So it's that level of like um, shoddiness, quite honestly, um, that's in the Clark Report. And that's just one example. Um, so I, I just want to quickly as well, just finally, because I know we're going to run out of time, is just talk quickly about some of the critiques from the British media, which I mentioned. I should say there's lots of other things people should... It's a brilliant podcast and bromance. It's kind of a, a buddy movie. It's a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a buddy movie. Let's be honest with you. It's a buddy movie. Uh, no, it's, it's a brilliant piece of investigative journalism. Uh, you know, Birmingham <laughs> City Council submitting the Trojan Horse letter to tribunal as evidence of a plot, even though the letter they knew was not credible. We could go on. So, okay, just quick. Let's just go through these quickly. Some of them. So, some would say, look, whatever you think about the Trojan Horse affair, it was a long time ago. Community relations are a sensitive issue. Why reopen this now? Why reopen these wounds? Brian. I, mean, I just think it's a I think reopening wounds is a weird metaphor <laughs> to apply to investigative journalism. This is a situation in which an acknowledged forgery was used by people at the highest levels of British government to justify sweeping, long-lasting um, policy changes in education and counter-terror policy that are still in effect today, that, that have been shown to disproportionately affect Britain's minority communities and Muslim communities. Um, just think about that. A known forgery was used by Britain's top officials to justify sweeping policy and, and law changes to look into what that forgery was actually about, to try to figure out who perpetrated it and what if, and what officials knew when about it is not reopening old wounds. That is trying to find some closure and you know, provide a factual understanding of what actually happened here. Um, you know, and then there's just other examples of, of a lack of closure too. Those um, misconduct hearings that Hamza mentioned uh, among the educators, you know, that you could argue would be an opportunity for a process to happen whereby there's some kind of decision or, you know, in public, in public hearings, some kind of factual understanding as to what happened in the Trojan Horse Affair. Those proceedings, after years and more than a million pounds at least spent on them by the government, fell apart. They had to be vacated by the panel because of misconduct by the government's lawyers. The lawyers were... Um, hid evidence that they should have uh, provided to the to the teachers' uh, legal teams for years and misled the panel about it as well. And the panel, in an extraordinary decision, you know, people have read this who work in employment law and said they've never read a decision like this. After all that investment, vacated the hearings and all but one um, misconduct uh, proceeding fell apart completely. Nobody was vindicated, but nobody was found, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, found to have done wrongdoing either. That's complete lack of closure. Looking into what actually happened is not reopening old wounds. It's the role that investigative journalists have in society, I believe. So uh, under the critique is this. Okay, sure, the letters are forgery, but there are genuine problems in these schools. It might not be some big organized plot, but there are genuine problems and the podcast elides over them. That's basically one of the main critiques. What, what would you say to that? Hamza, what do you think? I mean, firstly, it's just, I don't know if that critique is coming from people who've heard the podcast. If people have heard the podcast, and I know it's, you know, it's asking a lot because it is eight hours. It's a long series. I get it. It's not, it's not one article that you can digest in a couple of minutes and decide, okay, I'm going to, you know, tear this apart. You have to hear it. I'm sorry. There's a transcript. You can read it if you don't want to listen to our voices. That's okay. Read the transcript the great, they're, such, they're such dulcet tones. Why would anyone not want to listen? Hey, listen, to each their own. To each their own. I understand. I don't like to hear my voice in my ear the whole day. So fine, yeah. read the transcript. I say, listen, the music's very nice. The music's very nice. It's great. great. It yeah. bangs. It bangs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Either way, take in the information. And then if you still feel that we have minimized any of this, I'd love to hear why. Uh, because we spent from a, you know, um, eight part series, there's two episodes that are dedicated to all of this stuff that people say we've um, overlooked somehow. Putting that to one side, imagine that's, if that's even an um, honest critique. I feel like people are like yada yada yadding over the fact that like <laughs> piece of misinformation changed our laws. Even, for example, um, 
one of your uh, colleagues at The Observer um, in her piece, Sonia Soda, um, she wrote this line that I can remember when I was reading it, um, like just kind of being struck by it to be like, the letter was used to justify controversial reforms to counterterrorism laws. I'm like, okay, let's just take that sentence for a second. You were admitting that a piece of misinformation was used by government ministers to change our laws. But that, that's it. Like, don't worry about that. Who cares about that? Let's, let's, let's speak about these, um, you know, text messages from this teacher in a WhatsApp group, you know? Like, I just find it bizarre to kind of think that that matters less than this. These are individual cases um, and individual people who are responsible and have been held responsible and have admitted to uh, the wrongs of, of, of um, their kind of statements and stuff like this. Over here are politicians who have barely had to account for the fact that they used, knowingly used a bogus letter to change our laws. And for, for reporters in Britain, that seems to be okay and we shouldn't be mindful of that. Whereas over here, this person who's already apologized for this text, we should write a, another column about, about him. Um, it's, yeah, for me, I, I, I don't know what the, uh, what, why the emphasis is on, is on one and the other. Well, I kind of do, but I don't want to say it. So the other issue about journalistic standards, and as you know, the British media across the board takes journalistic standards very, very seriously, particularly when it comes to reporting on issues to do with British Muslims. So I think in the spirit of the real burning commitment, so much of the British media shows <laughs> on a daily basis yeah. towards one of the most your, marginalized... Your facetiousness is just dripping. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most marginalized and discriminated minorities of the country whose lives are made deliberately very, very difficult. Uh, on a daily basis by the British uh, media. So I just think, you know, it's great. We should honour, we should, you know, it's very important. So, for example, they would argue that, well, they did argue that certain interviewees, they just, they, you told them you'd have a general conversation, then you asked detailed questions instead. And as everyone can either see or if they're listening to podcasts here, you're both exceptionally intimidating um, <laughs> individuals. Um, <laughs> no, just explain this. So, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being over, I'm going overboard. I don't, I'm not pretending to be objective. It doesn't make really matter in my case i'm like a lot of the british media who pretend to be objective and then are essentially as polemical as i am but anyway so yeah you you just wanted to have a general chat and then you starzied them i mean that's just not that's just there's nothing to argue there that's just not true we didn't ever i would never i would did not tell anybody that we'd have a general chat there's a couple interviewees that 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 reporters have reported that that happened with um and we you know, or, or writers, and we provided like quotes from my emails in case you needed proof um, of me explaining, like, we want to do a comprehensive story about the Trojan horse affair. We're excited to talk to you about your experience. I'm flying from New York to come meet you to do it. Um, you know, in some cases saying, I want to have enough time to go into detail. It's just not true. Like, I just would not tell people that. I mean, just to and say. Terms, yeah, and in an interview style, like, yeah, go ahead, Hansel, take it. No, I was going to say, just to say, any any, any uh, source in a story who, for whatever reason, uh, had this impression that Brian and I would just come around for a chit-chat is because that's what they're used to doing with reporters in Britain. That's because journalists turn up for a chit-chat with them and have turned up for years for a chit-chat with them. So if we turn up with actual questions, it does feel different. I, 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 I can understand that. Like, if it will feel different. It will feel like you, you will feel a bit more rattled than you would. Because we're not here to just have a general chit chat. We're, we're here to understand the truth and speak to evidence. So what about the, so for example, people say interviews were offered anonymity. Obviously, anonymity is very important when people, if they think they're getting anonymity. And then they were identified or you interviewed people you shouldn't have. That's the other point. Exonerating people who are disreputable. What you say? Those three things. There we go. Three big things I've thrown at you. The charge. I mean, we we never promised anybody anonymity and reneged on that ever, 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 ever. That just never happened. And again, just to be clear, yeah. like we've shared this evidence with the reporters who are writing these articles. Like we've 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 pointed them to to our emails with these sources to be like, at what point? Like you know, to be say like, yeah, we're going to keep you anonymized. Um, but it doesn't matter. Like that, that, that's what I'm so confused about in terms of what's happening at the editorial level uh, at newspapers in Britain to be like, you know, like if, if a report is sent this uh, as part of a right reply, this information and this evidence, and they decide to just, I will decide that thing. Um, like who gets to make that decision? Like who's overseeing this? Who's, who's checking this? What about this point? Dubious characters being exonerated. Yeah, there's this weird um, kind of sense I get in some of the like, critiques 
where it's like ascribing a motive to us that I don't recognize <laughs> in our work. Um, our motive is to seek the truth. Um, it's to tell it in an engaging way. Um, you know, like to tell, like we want to tell a story that engages people, that people want to listen to, that people can understand and understand the importance of what we're finding as well. Um, like, you know, we have a few motivations. Um, exonerating somebody is not one of them. And that's just not, that's not our motive. And it's not what we're trying to do with our reporting. We're trying to report and seek the truth. And it's, it's just weird for, I, like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's a. I think that's a shorthand. I don't recognize it. I don't recognize it in. I feel like dubious characters are shorthand. Yeah. A couple of points because I read as I'm violating journalistic practices by overrunning the slot we were given with you both. You probably have other things to do, so but I'll try and wrap this up quickly. Um, We're okay. We we have have a little time if you need it. Yeah, we we got. Um, So just final couple of these before I just actually just the final general wrap up kind of thing. Um, Yeah, the the, an interview style felt to two interviewees to be like torture. To be fair, anyone stuck. I mean, with my anyone who's been in my presence for more than like you both have. This is probably torture. This is my (laughs) my whiny my whiny northern accent. What's left of it? Yeah. Blah blah blah. Shut up, Erin. Get to the point. Ask a question. Anyway, like yeah. torture. You talk. You 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 subjected to torture. Like interview. I mean, what do you even say to that? I don't, I don't, I don't, we ask tough questions. We spent months going through thousands of pages of documents to prepare for an interview, and then asked about the evidence. Uh, you know, like that is what we did. I don't know how it felt, but it was completely professional, and you know, <laughs> it was what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, in general, can I just say, like, in response to like, like. All these things are kind of raised under this like this claim of like you're breaking journalistic standards. You guys are like kind of like running afoul of journalistic standards. But the kind of broad arguments seem to be you're not going easy enough on sources in interviews. You're going too hard on sources in interviews. You're not bending to their later claims that they want anonymity um, and like retroactively offering anonymity after an interview that didn't go the way they wanted it to. Um, like those are the kinds of things that they're saying are running a foul of journalistic standards, which run exactly opposite to my understanding of journalistic standards, which is that you're respectful of people, but you ask tough questions if warranted by the evidence. You don't retroactively, unless there's you know circumstances that you know really warrant it, offer anonymity to especially someone after an interview, you know, you know, where there were revealing things that came out of it. Like it's just I don't know if it's disingenuous or just a complete opposite understanding of the standards under which we should be operating as well, investigative journalists. The mistake you make, because one of the yeah. rules that a lot of uh, people in the British media abide by is always ask very tough questions of critics of the government, people who are seen to dissent in some way. Then you then you mercilessly throw everything at them, not other people. Just uh, finally, before I just do the kind of wrap up, what, we, what we've what we learned from this, the Jerry Seinfeld sign off. Um and this is, yeah, this is, again, this is something which has been raised about ignoring or minimizing homophobia, misogyny, and child protection concerns. I suppose this links back here. That's not process. It links back again to this, that idea of, um, fine, there wasn't a plot. Fine, there wasn't this big forged letter. There was a forged letter, but there was something bad happening. We report on that stuff. I mean, to the, to the, to the extent that it was evidenced and supported, that's all reported on in the podcast. It's not ignored. It's not minimized. It's presented to the audience in the context of everything else that happened so that listeners can make a judgment about whether they feel what happened was justified. Um, I feel the New York yeah. Times as well would probably have, I mean, presumably the New York Times have had to sift through a lot of this. And mm-hmm. if they felt that you were responsible for these grievous violations of journalistic standards, I think the New York Times would have, I mean, what have the New York Times said? I mean, that's what I find so that's what I find so comical is that like the impression that these British reports are given, and I, I, it's it's you know like the power that they're given me is 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 quite um is quite flattering because they seem to think that this guy from Birmingham has somehow strong armed Brian Reed at This American Life when I first met him, then Serial, one of the biggest like podcast pr- production companies, and then the New York Times. He's managed to somehow get all of them to just like bend to his whim and put out. That's this the podcast. real plot. That's the real. Yeah, plot, there you, I mean, yeah. like we did have a line that got cut, like like joking that Tra- Hamza was the Trojan horse in this story. Yeah. At one point, we had a joke. Yeah, I think we should do yeah. a podcast yeah. into Hamza. We should do yeah. that. <laughs> exactly. really? Listen, if I have done that, then I've, I've, I feel like I would take all of these uh, hit pieces and I'll frame my wall. I'd be like, that's an amazing achievement for me to have done. 
Like, yes, we have a huge editorial team. We have a legal team. We have a standards team. Like every single person has to okay this stuff before it goes goes out. Yeah. Um, so like, whatever. Meticulous what fact have. checking. Meticulous fact checking. Yeah. I do feel like one, I wish like in a certain way, there's something about the format of, of narrative podcasting that is still new that I feel like um, there's maybe not just, and, and I do take responsibility for this. Like there's maybe not an understanding of the audience of the journalism behind it because it is produced it's told as a, you know, we, we do prize narrative as a way to deliver reporting yeah, um, and emotion. Feels. Yeah, like, like, um, but it can maybe make you feel like there's not real journalism behind it or that the journalism is different. And um, while we are trying to experiment and we're not afraid to push the bounds of, of, of how journal, journalism is presented and done, it is done with the rigorous, like basics, you know, kind of fundamental standards that all investigative journalism should be done. And, you know, again, meticulous fact checking, like meticulous legal review, you know, like I, I imagine more fact checking than most publications you read, it, you know, goes into this podcast. So yeah. there's very real and um, solid journalism behind all of it. And before, by the way, I just get rinsed again by not always very popular with my colleagues there's some great fantastic courageous journalists in britain who have done uh brilliant mm -hmm. work for example on for example the windrush scandal there are journalists of course, of course who, speak, yeah, yeah. who speak to power hashtag not all journalists but no i i, yeah. I suppose the, the point i'd make is, is just kind of wrapping up really is a systemic issue which is what i'm interested in which is why often i think british some british journalists take any they don't understand what systemic critique is they don't understand um that that's not saying individually every journalist is bad, <laughs> but I am interested in, you know, I mean, my first two books in large part were about the British media, um, about classism and so on. I'm interested in what the think it says about. It looks like a closing of ranks. It do, it does. It feels like it. It feels like the British media often behave like um, uh, like a like a um, a host with a kind of foreign invading virus, and they kind of like the antibodies all come out and attack them. I mean, what's it? What what what's your ex you know? How's it felt to be on the receiving end of that? Because they have they've really gone for the podcast. I'm gonna really I'm gonna let you have the final word, Hamza. But I, I just want to stay on a positive note here that you raised, Owen, which is I would like to say to the British media, I want to invite you guys into this story. This is not the biggest story happening right now. There's a lot happening in the news, but it is a story. It's important. Again, a known forgery was used by people at the highest levels of government to pass sweeping laws. And I think we found a lot in our podcast and I'm very proud of our investigation uncovered a lot. There's still questions that remain. There's still loose ends. There's a lot of interesting reporting to do in this story about the letter and how it was dealt with. And you guys are there and I, I invite you in to pick up where we left off. I would, I know Hans and I would love that. We've actually been like begging some journalists in the UK to do this. We're happy to give you guys leads. Like this is a good story. There's good reporting there. Trust us. There's stuff that we have that we weren't able to run down. There's just really interesting stuff and important public interest investigative journalism to be done. And um, I would just personally like offer an invitation. Like if you're really interested in doing like following up some of this stuff, give us a call. Like we'll, we'll give you some leads. <laughs> totally. yeah, Andrew, just, I want you to wrap up with the, yeah. the Jerry Seinfeld uh, end of the, you know, where he does the little moral <laughs> lesson. No, but what I'm interested in just tell us kind of what would you like to happen what would you like this podcast to do what do you really want its legacy to be what do you want it to inspire if you like and to tell people listening to it what this state says about the state of our society and the way british muslims in this country are a very big and important part of british society and yet often feel very under siege what it says in relation to that i suppose yeah i mean uh, it was it to each subgroup, I kind of had different intentions. For British Muslims, I wanted them to hear this and not feel uh, overwhelmed or dejected or even just kind of confirming how disenfranchised they are. I wanted them to hear this and be outraged and gain a sense of confidence um, about their ability to be able to speak out and at least get someone to hear what they had to say. You know, this is the biggest podcast in the world right now that have become British. Uh, uh, you know, Muslim who lives in Birmingham. So I wanted that to kind of be the legacy for British Muslims. For everyone else, the idea was that like it would create um, that pause that was missing in 2014, that before you see a headline and assume, you know, the worst, 
um, what had always been missing from the Trojan horse was evidence. So Brian and I have gone and spent a couple of years pulling the evidence together. Now we hope that you understand that situation uh, differently um, and think on that. Think on what that means in terms of the impression you carried in 2014 and the impression you'd carry now if there's some facts and evidence. If you allow that pause to occur, um, I feel like people will, you know, uh, mistakes like this will happen less frequently because people expect evidence and facts before they believe something. I'm not sure if that's happened um, in terms of as a legacy. And then as far as um, my most immediate concerns now, is I want one journalist, one journalist in England to go to Birmingham and ask some follow-ups from the council and from Adelaide Primary School and Michael Gove eventually. But that's, that's, I want that now. That's all I want now. And that's like, you know, my um kind of um lack of hope for like what, I, what i'm going to achieve with this podcast is just responding to what's happened in the last two three weeks uh, in britain all i want now is just for one journalist to be motivated to go ask some follow-ups from the council and adelaide and um i don't i don't know if that's that's even gonna happen to be honest but that's what i would like it's a good challenge to have look both of you it's been an absolute honor it really is a superb really really superb podcast it says as i said i think a lot about britain in the this part of the, the, the first fifth of the 21st century. Um, and I think for years to come, it will, it will stand in that context. Um, it's fascinating. Just lots of things are fascinating about it. The, the dynamic, as I said, the bromance uh, between an exceptionally, obviously very experienced journalist and Hamza, someone who becomes, you know, picks up, you can see just trains as a journalist throughout <laughs> the entire, throughout that journey. You really do go on a journey with, with both of you. It, it is speak, you know, the best traditions of what journalism should be, which is speaking truth to power. Um, and often much too much of not just the British media decides to stand up to, as they see it, some of the most marginalised minorities and communities in the country with pretty disastrous consequences, actually, for people in a very difficult and uh, vulnerable circumstances. So it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of investigative journalism, one of the best pieces, I think, of investigative journalism for a long time. So I know there's a lot going on that people have noticed. The world is on fire. Uh, do take time out to, to listen to it and, and to spread uh, the word as well. So thank you both. to bo Thank you both. But to both of you, whatever. I don't. I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> Thanks to both of you um, for for that. It was it was really brilliant, and it was an honour to have you both. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Please support this channel for independent thought discussion of the most important issues that we face. <laughs>